I'm sorry to have arrived a little late. I was recalling an incident that happened in the 18th century. Two friends in London opposite the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane had a bet. One said to the other, I bet you that we could announce that we something utterly incredible and impossible was going to happen in Drury Lane Theatre and that enough people would be sufficiently foolish to come along and see this impossible event. So they took the bet on and they hired the theatre for one evening and they said on such and such a day at 7.30 p.m. in the Theatre Royal Drury Lane, a gentleman of quality will get inside a beer bottle and while inside the beer bottle he will sing all five verses of the national anthem as well as other patriotic songs and any member of the audience may come along and examine the bottle while he is inside it. This was duly announced in placards throughout London and all the tickets were sold out. So evidently the person won his bet that there would be enough fools to come along and see something that was manifestly impossible. Well, what happened was they all arrived at the due time at Drury Lane Theatre and there on the stage there was a table and on the bare table there was a beer bottle. But no gentleman of quality appeared to get inside the beer bottle and after a time the audience grew bored with waiting and so they broke up the furniture in the theatre and they took it all outside and they made a great bonfire. Well, I'm glad to say that you haven't yet broken up the furniture <laughs> and made a bonfire while you were waiting for me. So now, I will get inside my beer bottle and sing my little song. In fact, I'm going to give two talks. The first lecture will deal with the position of the Orthodox Church in the traditional Orthodox countries, and I have entitled that Fresh Hope and New Challenges. And the second talk will look at Orthodoxy in the Western world, and there I have given as my title Not Ethnic But Global. There is a story, a folk story, retold by the Russian writer Tolstoy called Three Questions. The hero in the story has to find out the answer to three questions. What is the most important moment? Who is the most important person? What is the most important task? As in all such stories, he has various adventures before he eventually finds out the answer. What is the most important moment? The most important moment is now. The past has gone. You cannot change it. The future is not here as yet. It does not lie in your power. The only moment in time that lies within your power is the present moment, now. And the answer to the other two questions is similar. Who is the most important person? It is the person to whom I am speaking now, at this moment. And what is the most important task? It is the task 
that I am engaged on, here and now. So the moral of that little story retold by Tolstoy is how it is supremely important to dwell in the present moment, maximize the moment. You must seize the keros, the moment of opportunity, now, today. That is what God says to us. How did Christ begin his public preaching? In St. Luke's Gospel, we are told that he went to the synagogue in the place where he'd grown up, and all the people present there would have known him from his childhood. And he asks for the scroll, and he reads the words of the prophet Isaiah and then he hands the scroll back to the synagogue attendant and everybody is waiting what will this new prophet whom we've known since childhood have to say and how does Christ begin his public preaching what are his first words he says, today is this scripture fulfilled in your ear, in your sight. Today, that is where Christ begins his public preaching. The desert fathers of Egypt used to make the same point. They would say, there is a voice which speaks to every one of us right up to the moment of our death. And this voice says to us, today. So then, what is the keros, the moment of opportunity that we Orthodox are facing today? in a postmodern era, in a society that not only in the West, but in traditional Orthodox countries, such as Greece, is growing increasingly secular. Let us start our reflections today by thinking about the nature of the church, about the church as paradox. In the uh, second century writing, The Shepherd, written by Hermas, there is a double vision of the church. First of all, he sees the church as an old woman, dignified and very beautiful, but of great age. And he is told she was created before all things, and because of her the world was framed. That is the first vision he has of the church. And then secondly, he sees the church as an uncompleted tower to which fresh stones are constantly being added. So there we have two aspects of the church. The first vision of the church as an old woman expresses and reflects the eternity of the divine realm. We think of the church as the bride of Christ, perfect, sinless, 
unchanging. And we Orthodox are fond of emphasizing this aspect of the church. We just heard David make a reference to a radio program in America called Ancient Faith. Not a title that I particularly like, but still, um, I suppose I'm an ancient person, if you wish to think in those terms. And yes, we are proud as Orthodox that our faith is ancient. We think of ourselves as the Church of Holy Tradition, as heirs to a rich inheritance. We see the Church, the Orthodox Church, as being in direct continuity from the age of the Apostles and the Martyrs, from the Epoch of the Fathers and the Ecumenical Councils, heirs to the Christian Empire of Byzantium. And so often when we bear witness in the West, what we say to Western Christians is, we are your past. Here the West might legitimately reply, we are your future, which leads me to respond, I hope not. <laughs> Yet this is only part of the orthodox situation. We should allow also for the second vision that Hermes looked at, the uncompleted tower. The church is essentially involved in history, in a world of change and conflict. Throughout the 2000 years of Orthodox Church history, conservatism is constantly modified by change and change is constantly impinging upon conservatism. And that is precisely the peculiar fascination of these 2,000 years. So then, bearing in mind Hermas' double vision of the church, we could sum up this paradox of the church on earth in two phrases. The first is a phrase that I take from the Russian Orthodox theologian, Father George Florovsky. Adapting Plato, he says that the church is the living image of eternity in time. And in that definition of the church, the living image of eternity in time, we should give equal emphasis to, on the one side, the word eternity, and on the other side, to the word time. There's also a second phrase that Father George Florovsky uses, as also do other Orthodox writers such as Father John Meyendorf, and that is living tradition. Tradition, that is to say, is not simply a protective, conservative principle but it is primarily a principle of growth and regeneration. Holy tradition is not just a collection of texts and documents composed long ago, but it is a lived experience. Here and now, today, The church as a community of holy tradition has its face turned both to the past and to the future. It's interesting that 
the Russian theologian Vladimir Losky defines tradition as the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. Tradition is not merely something given from the past, static, complete. It is an ongoing life. And exactly the Holy Spirit is associated with dynamic images such as wind and fire. Father George Florovsky says of tradition that it is the critical spirit of the church. Critical. We do not simply accept the past. We relive the past. <coughs> so then, thinking of the Orthodox Church in the 21st century, let us hold before our minds this idea of the Church as both old and new. I think of a famous phrase in the Confessions of St. Augustine, where he says to God, Cero te amavi, pulcritudo tam antiqua et tam nova. Too late have I loved you, beauty so ancient and yet so young. So ancient and yet so young, antiqua et nova. That is the kind of self-image that I would wish us Orthodox to have as we embark on the second decade of the 21st century. Now, to appreciate the present Keros, to attempt an educated guess about the future, we need to look also at the past. The history of orthodoxy in the century that has recently been completed, the 20th century, was largely determined by two decisive events occurring within five years of each other. The first of these events was the Russian Revolution of 1918, the October Revolution. This was the cause of a fundamental and for many a catastrophic change in the situation of the church within the Russian Empire. Before the Russian Revolution, the Orthodox Church had a secure place under a Christian empire, emperor. The church played a central role in all aspects of the national life. It enjoyed economic support from the state. It had a privileged position in education. With the Bolshevik Revolution, all this was brutally abolished. The state, so far from favouring the church, adopted an attitude of militant atheism. The church lost all its financial subsidies, and not only that, it was disendowed. All its bank accounts were seized. All its land was taken over. Church and state were separated. Church and education were separated. There was a massive closure of places of worship of monasteries, of theological schools, countless martyrs, and 
communism after the Second World War was then extended to the rest of Eastern Europe, to Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria, among other countries. The persecution in the post-war period of Christianity was less savage than it had been in Russia in the 20s and 30s, yet nonetheless it was an oppressive reality. Let us recall that 85% of Orthodox Christians during the period following the Second World War for 40 years lived under an atheist regime. So that's the first event that shaped orthodoxy from an external point of view in the 20th century. And then the second event that I have in mind is the Asia Minor disaster of 1922. You will remember that Greece, following the First World War, following the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire, thought that the moment of opportunity had come for them to recover the areas in Asia Minor that had once been largely Greek. So they embarked on an invasion of Turkey, an ill-advised invasion which ended in disaster. And as a result of that, 1923, by the Treaty of Lausanne, there was an exchange of populations what we today would call ethnic cleansing. The Greeks of Asia Minor, who in most cases were, had been there for very many centuries, they were not recent emigrants, and most of them spoke Turkish, and many of them indeed didn't speak Greek. But if you were an Orthodox Christian who were deemed to be Greek, and so you were expelled from Asia Minor, from the places where you and your family had lived for centuries. They, you lost everything. You had to march on foot to the nearest point on the coast where you were herded into boats and taken over to Greece. That affected about a million and a half of people. Hundreds of thousands seem to have died on the way. There was no mercy shown to old people or to young children. In this way, the ecumenical patriarchate lost most of its flock in Turkey. The Christians in Constantinople itself were exempt. So ancient Christian centers dating back to New Testament times, Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, among others, were rendered desolate. Greece at that time had, I suppose, about six million people, and they had to absorb at one moment, a million and a half refugees, equivalent to a quarter of the population. How would we do in Great Britain today if overnight we had to receive 15 million homeless and destitute people? But we have a population of about 60 million. That gives you some idea of the enormity of the task facing the Greek people at that moment. 
on the whole the Greek government coped very well. The number of Turks, that is to say Muslims, living in Greece who were transferred to Turkey was much smaller, probably not more than half a million. And of course the population of Turkey was much larger. So for the Turkish people the event was also traumatic but less formidable than it was for the Greeks. So these two events, the Russian Revolution and the Asia Minor disaster, alter the outward face of orthodoxy in far-reaching ways. From one point of view, both of them were, for the orthodox, disasters. But a disaster can also be an opportunity. And one of the effects of those two events has been the emigration of huge numbers of Orthodox to the West, to areas that are not traditional Orthodox countries. An extensive uprooting. And that's what I should be speaking about this afternoon. So bearing in mind those two events, what is our situation as Orthodox? In traditional Orthodox countries at this moment and what kind of a future do we face? Now, I'll not be speaking of the non-Chalcedonians, of the Copts, the Ethiopians, the Syrian and Indian Orthodox and the Armenians. I'll only be speaking of the, let us call them, Byzantine Orthodox. We are found today in three different situations so far as the traditional Orthodox countries go. First, we have the four ancient patriarchates, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem in the Eastern Mediterranean. Here, we Orthodox exist as a small minority in a predominantly Muslim environment. Yes, in the Patriarchate of Antioch, that's to say in Lebanon and Syria, we are a fairly substantial minority, but nonetheless the Mohammedans are the great majority. And on the whole, in these four ancient patriarchates, we find ourselves today faced by an increasingly aggressive Islam. Under the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim authorities were far more tolerant of Christians than they are today. The situation has grown much more difficult and that is happening year by year. For example, and this affects the Copts chiefly, but also the Greek Orthodox in Alexandria, the Egyptian government is growing far less tolerant now. You might say, well, dwelling side by side with Muslims, there are many possibilities for a Muslim Orthodox dialogue. Well, that is not on the whole happening, at any rate locally, in the Eastern Mediterranean. The Muslim Orthodox dialogue is a luxury 
that we are able to indulge in here in the West. But the people living on the spot don't have so many opportunities. Now, the Orthodox in a predominantly Muslim environment are in general simply aiming at survival, hanging on as best they can, attempting to keep going. There is little prospect of any expansion or creative development at the moment in these ancient Christian centers. On the contrary, there is a general tendency for us to be losing ground in these countries. For example, Constantinople, the seat of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. As I mentioned just now, the Christians in the city of Constantinople, today Istanbul, under the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, were exempt from the transfer of populations. I suppose at the beginning of the 20th century, the Christians amounted to about a third of the population in Constantinople, which perhaps had three quarters of a million people at that time, and there were about 250,000 Christians in Constantinople, most of them Greek Orthodox. Now, today, Istanbul has, what, 12 million or so. It has grown enormously. There are all kinds of settlements of people living in huts uh, without any proper facilities of water or sanitation on the edges of Constantinople. And how many Christians are there in Constantinople? Orthodox Christians, there are probably between three and five thousand permanent residents and a less clear number of Greeks and others, Orthodox Christians, who are in Turkey temporarily with jobs there. So now, instead of being one third of the population of Istanbul, the Greek Orthodox community is a tiny minority. There was in September 1955 a very ugly anti-Christian riot in which two-thirds of the Orthodox churches in Constantinople were sacked and great damage was done in the Christian orphanages to the children. And as a result of this riot, which had been carefully planned, this was followed by a massive emigration of Greeks from the city. They no longer felt safe and many of them were deported by force. People who'd lived, as I say, for centuries there and had all their possessions, uh, they were forced to leave simply with one suitcase which they could carry, but they were not allowed to take anything else and the equivalent, I think, of 18 pounds. So they lost their homes, their bank accounts, their jobs, everything. The Orthodox Theological Seminary of Halki was closed in 1973. So the Patriarchate no longer had any center for training future candidates for the priesthood. And to give you some impression of the situation of the Orthodox community in the 1980s, 
I remember the experience of one of the Greek bishops at Constantinople, Metropolitan Maximus of Stavropolis, who had been the Scholarchis, the uh, head of the school of Halki. His parents were both in Greece, and his mother was dying. He, of course, was a Turkish citizen, and he asked for a visa to go to Greece. It was refused by the Turkish authorities. So his mother died without him having the opportunity to see her. The year later, his father was dying. Once more he applied for a visa. Once more he was told no. So he could not go to see his parents who were dying. That may give you some impression of the conditions in which Orthodox Christians were living. In the last 20 years, however, in Constantinople, there has been a slight improvement. The present ecumenical patriarch, Bartholomew, is allowed to travel freely to the West, and he often does so. His predecessor, Patriarch Demetrius, hardly ever travelled abroad. During his patriarchate, presumably he was afraid that if he did so, he would be refused readmission to Constantinople. He would just have been told, you stay in Greece, we don't want you. The bishops can also travel freely, unlike Metropolitan Maximus wanting to visit his parents. The Patriarchate in Constantinople is able to organize congresses and other meetings. So there is a great deal more freedom. The buildings of the Patriarchate, much of them were burnt down in 1940 or thereabouts, an accidental fire. But for many decades, planning permission was refused for them to rebuild. But then again, in the 1980s, they were allowed to rebuild the central building of the Patriarchate, which greatly improved their conditions. But the School of Halki still remains closed. The, some Turkish officials make encouraging statements that it may be reopened, but nothing has happened so far. And so the Patriarchate has no centre to train its clergy, and it suffers from a great shortage of personnel. It's difficult to maintain a full staff of clergy and the Holy, Holy Synod of 12 bishops if you've only got a home base of about 3,000 Christians. In fact, Orthodox come from abroad and help in the Patriarchate, but they are not granted work permits by the Turkish authorities. They have to come with a tourist visa, which only lasts three months. Then they can leave, go for a few days to Greece, and come back again and continue, and the Turks let them do this, though they must realize they're not tourists. But the refusal of work permits is a fairly settled policy of the Turkish authorities. The ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew said to me one day when I was visiting there, yes, our position is easier, but all the concessions that have been made to us could be withdrawn overnight by the Turkish government. We have no guarantees of security. We could be told tomorrow, pack your bags and go, and there's nothing we could do about it. In the 19th century, if the Ottoman Empire had tried to do that, 
then a country like Britain would have stopped them and would have gone to war to prevent any such persecution of Christians. But we know that in the 21st century, while there will be protests from the Western governments, they will not in the end be willing to do anything. That is the reality. So the future in Constantinople is uncertain. In Alexandria and Egypt generally, there are very few Greek Orthodox Christians. Most Christians are Copts. There's been a lot of pressure there, and I don't see any improvement. And there's been large-scale emigration. So far as the Patriarchate of Alexandria goes, there, it has, however, jurisdiction over the whole of Africa, not just Egypt. And elsewhere, there has been major expansion, and there's been the development of an African Orthodox movement in Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania, which is growing and is quite dynamic. So it's not all gloomy. Antioch has, of course, suffered. The Patriarch of Antioch doesn't actually live at Antioch, which is inside Turkey. He lives in Damascus and has for many centuries. But here the Christians have suffered a good deal from the troubles in the Lebanon in the 1980s, and they are suffering now severely from the civil war in Syria. It is interesting to note that dictators like Assad in Syria or Saddam in Iraq have been on the whole quite friendly towards the Christians. They may be loathsome tyrants, but they have treated the Christian communities with considerable justice. This is often overlooked. Um, Iraq, of course, the Christians there belong mainly either to the so-called Monophysite Church that doesn't accept Chalcedon or to the so-called Nestorian Church, the Church of the East, the Assyrian <coughs> Church. And they have suffered very severely since the invasion of Iraq. The ill-advised actions, if I may be a little controversial, the ill-advised actions of Bush, Bomber Bush, and Blair, Bomber Blair, in Iraq, have had the effect of destroying Christian communities that existed without interruption from the first century. Blair now, no doubt in full sincerity, assumes the role of a Christian philanthropist, but his rule was not helpful to the Christians of the Near East. And we should recognize that our intervention by Britain as well as America in Iraq has largely destroyed the Christians there. It's all very well to invade a country and execute a tyrant, but then if you leave the country in chaos, you are highly responsible. I remember when the invasion of Iraq first took place, I was visiting the United States and I was questioned about my attitude to the invasion of Iraq and I, by an orthodox audience, and I said I was very much against this. That you don't solve the internal problems of different countries by invading them. And my audience were astonished. They were all thinking, it's marvellous, wonderful crusade. Here we are liberating people from an evil tyrant, but look what's happened in Iraq in practice. And I think now many of my audience on that occasion would be less enthusiastic about what was done there. Uh, and I think we should bear that in mind over Syria, supporting the so-called freedom fighters, the insurgents, is not necessarily going to bring peace and justice to Syria.
So, yes, the dictators were not so severe to Christians. And if in these countries like Syria or Egypt, if they are replaced by militant Islamic regimes, the status of the Christians is going to grow much worse. So we should, I think, take that quite seriously. What about Jerusalem? That's unique in the uh, Orthodox world. It's governed by a monastic community. There's an interesting contrast between the Greek monastic brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre and the Arab faithful. Not one, I think, of the bishops is an Arab Christian, but nearly all the faithful are. In 1900, about 95% of the Christians in Palestine would have been Orthodox. Today, only 40% of the Christians in Palestine are Orthodox. Great numbers of them have become Latin Catholics, or Melkite Uniates, or Protestants. We have lost over half our flock in Palestine, and much of that has been due to proselytism by Western Christians against the Orthodox. Fortunately, the Anglicans do not proselytize the Orthodox. You know, they in Jerusalem, at any rate since uh, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, have played an honorable and supportive role towards the Orthodox. But that would not be true of other Protestant groups. So, I'm afraid looking at the four ancient patriarchates, we have to recognize they are all facing a difficult situation. They certainly need our prayers. Now coming to the second situation in of the Orthodox, uh, in the traditional Orthodox lands, we have Greece. And this is the only part of the world where the Orthodox constitute a great majority of the population never subject to communism. Perhaps we should put Cyprus in the same category. Now in Greece there is still a close association between uh, the church and the nation, between the church and the state. The state still pays the Orthodox clergy, though their salaries last year were halved because of the um, dire economic crisis in Greece. But it wasn't only the Orthodox clergy who suffered. My friends who teach in universities in Greece, they also have lost half their salary. Now just imagine, those of you who are in employment, what would you do if overnight you were told your salary was going to be cut by 50%? How would you pay your mortgages, for example? So that's very difficult. Incidentally, though I said the state pays the Orthodox clergy, in fact, in Greece, uh, the state has confiscated nearly all the church lands in the 19th century. And so what the state is doing when it pays the Orthodox clergy is compensation for all the land that they seized from the church. It's worth remembering that a body such as the Church of England in this land has never suffered disendowment. It's never had its land and investments taken from it. So it's just compensation rather than a kindly, uh, generous payment from the government. And yes, the seminaries the different theological schools, uh, these two are still being 
uh, maintained by the state. They are part of the general educational system. But though the church-state alliance is still close in Greece, it is now becoming weaker. The last census in Greece in which people were asked about their church membership was in 1951. And at that time, only 121 persons in the whole of Greece said they were atheists. The vast majority said they were orthodox. And those 121 people were quite courageous because by saying that they were atheists, in the eyes of most of their fellow Greeks, they would have been renouncing their Greek identity by making such an admission because it would have been assumed then and it's still assumed by most Greeks today, that if you are Greek, then you are a member of the Orthodox Church. Your Orthodox identity is part of your national identity. I recall uh, having lunch once with a Greek dentist in Jerusalem some years ago, and I was also with a, a friend of mine, likewise English, who was a Roman Catholic. And the Greek dentist said to us, you have both betrayed your nation. Why, he said, you, pointing to my friend, you shouldn't be a Roman Catholic, if you're English, you should be Anglican. And you shouldn't be Orthodox, you should be Anglican. Why, he said, I personally am an atheist. But of course, because I'm Greek, I'm a member of the Orthodox Church. <laughs> Incidentally, the meat was very tough, so perhaps that was a way of getting trained as a dentist. Um, there was a census in Russia not long ago, I can't remember the details, but significantly more people said they were members of the Orthodox Church than said they believed in God. So this attitude that being Orthodox is not really a matter of personal faith, but a matter of national identity. This still continues. I remember my teacher, Anglican priest, Father Dervis Chitty, saying that when he entered Athens at the end of the war in October 1944, he said, for the first time in my life, I felt that I was in a Christian city. If you went to Athens today, I don't think you would have that impression. You would find it very like any other capital city in Europe. So the church-state alliance is growing weaker. In the 1980s, civil marriage was introduced and abortion under certain conditions was legalized. In the 2000s, there was a great dispute about identity cards, tautotites. The leader of the church at that time, Archbishop Christodoulos, took the view that the identity card should specify your religious membership. The government took the line that it should simply record external details <coughs> sufficient to identify you, but not questions of personal belief. Now, I myself took the view of the government uh, that if, for example, you are a Jehovah's Witness and you were involved in a car crash in rural Greece, the police, of course, the first thing they do is to look at your identity card. Oh, they would say. And the police in nearly all countries are pretty conservative. Um, oh, they would say, you are not orthodox, you are Jehovah's Witness. And immediately that would create a certain prejudice against you. So I think it was good not to include details of religious membership. But the then Archbishop, Christodoulos, vigorously defended the inclusion of identity. 
and he got together a referendum. Well, he didn't get a majority, but he got more than two million signatures of people who wanted to continue religious identity. So he may have lost, but you still see the power of the church. It is said that church attendance is falling in Greece, but I wouldn't exaggerate here. An Anglican priest friend of mine who was in Athens not long ago said to me when he went to church in one of the Orthodox parish churches there, he said, if I got that number of people in church on a Sunday, I would wonder what had hit me that you would find in the churches of Athens even though they have about they have two liturgies usually on Sunday, in one or two churches they even have three, uh, and you would get five hundred or more people for each service. But still, we can't be complacent. However, in the twentieth century there has been a revival of monasticism in Greece. There are many more nuns. Perhaps ten times as many nuns today in Greece as there were at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, among men's monasticism there's been a revival since the 1970s on the holy mountain of Athos. And this revival has spread to the United States and Canada. In the Greek archdiocese in North America, a monk from Athos, Father Ephraim, has within a decade opened more than 16 monasteries there in North America. So what is the future in Greece? Hitherto, Orthodoxy has been part of Greek national identity, but in the years to come, it will become a matter of choice, of personal commitment. Perhaps that's not a bad thing. We shall expect to see a smaller church, less wealthy, but a church perhaps more vibrant and more alive. What about the former communist lands? And here I must be brief, time is marching on. Since 1988 to 89, especially in the former Soviet Union, there's been an impressive renewal of ecclesial structures. 1988 to 9 in the Soviet Union, Russia and Ukraine together, there were about 7,000 churches open. Today there are well over 20,000 places of worship, a threefold increase. In 1989 there were, in Russia and Ukraine, no more than 16 or 18 monastic houses. Today there are more than 700 monasteries and many of them are quite large. For example, I visited a Divievo associated with St. Seraphim and in the monastery there, reopened in the early 1990s, um, well, when I was there, there were 100 nuns and 200 novices. How many Western monasteries have those sort of numbers of novices, I wonder. Uh, I'm told the number of nuns and novices today is about 400. The church under communism was identified with the opposition and that made it attractive to the younger generation. The church-state alliance has been greatly strengthened under the present patriarch Kirill and Putin. I'm not myself entirely happy about that. But we have to remember that despite this renewal, the number of regular churchgoers in Russia is probably not more than 5% of the population. The churches may be packed but let us not be under illusions here. Will the renewal, the revival, 
continue in Russia and elsewhere in the former communist countries such as Romania. Orthodoxy has survived militant atheism. It has shown a remarkable faithfulness in the face of persecution. Will it stand equally firm in the face of liberal secularism? May not a cynical tolerance prove more corrosive than open opposition? I think that applies not only to Russia and Ukraine, but probably also to Romania, but others can speak more about that who are present here. I recall the words of Origen, times of peace are favourable to Satan, for they rob Christ of his martyrs and the church of her glory on that slightly ambivalent note let me now invite your comments for the most part so far as the future goes I've been asking questions can you provide the answers I can make one observation which is um, a result of our uh, involvement in the way where we've been a leader uh, which has been adopted in Romania for catechesis of adults and I gather is going great guns there. Uh, that is a, a renewal of basic orthodox faith and it's said to be very successful in missionary terms but uh, an interesting uh, sidelight uh, when we're talking about the influence of the Western churches on orthodoxy has been that the driving force has been uh, a member of World Vision, Sven Spiriano. And uh, he, I think, began as a Baptist and has edged towards Anglicanism and is uh, looking hard at orthodoxy. But uh, he lent me a book which is now standard among uh, missionaries from the West acting in orthodox countries particularly, which is a whole change of attitude whereby you work through the church that is there rather than attempting to remold uh, Christianity according to an alien and Western outlook. Uh, have you, are you aware of this anywhere else in, in the orthodox world, this kind of uh, sensitivity? It's difficult to answer a question like that. Um, first of all, as regards the success of the way in Romania, that points to something of great importance in the former communist countries so far as the future goes that there is an enormous need for Christian education, adult education. In Russia, before the revolution, all children would have been taught about Christianity, about their faith in school. They would have been given quite a thorough grounding. And certainly uh, one of my parishioners who was in university in Russia before the revolution recalls that there were even compulsory lectures that you had to go to as a university student. Uh, she was in fact Jewish, so she was not required to go to these lectures. But if you were an Orthodox, you would have been. She chose to do so. And as a result, she became Christian because she was deeply impressed by one of the priests who lectured there. Um, though she only became Christian in the emigration. She said, as long as the church was a state church in Russia with a privileged position, 
It would never have entered my head to become orthodox. But when I saw a church that had lost all its privileges and was persecuted, then I thought differently. So there is a continuing need for education, Christian education, and that certainly applies to our Orthodox children here in the West as well. Um, when I was in Russia, for example, in one church I saw a notice uh, saying what you had to do if you wanted to get baptized. You were required to know by heart the Lord's Prayer and the Creed. Also to have read the whole of the New Testament. What as a secular person you would make of the book of Revelation, I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but still. Um, and you were required to have a half-hour interview with the priest. That was all. So this means that many people who are getting baptized quite sincerely, in fact, know very little about the faith. In the fourth century, there was a program for instructing catechumens. Um, if you read the uh, catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, you will find that uh, the catechism for the people wanting to be baptized lasted about three years. And at the end part, for the last 40 days before being baptized at Easter, you had to attend for three hours every day instruction. Well, compare that with a half-hour interview with the priest. We are simply not instructing our people in the way that the church used to do in earlier ages. However, there are lots of opportunities for adult education today, lots of opportunities for distance learning, and so we needn't be too pessimistic, but there is a real need to educate our people um, that very many devout Orthodox have never really been taught about their faith. And of course, there is the further question, how well is Church Slavonic understood by the average Russian? And how well is the Church Greek understood by Greeks today? I wouldn't say that nothing is understood, certainly, but we have to face up to the fact that the understanding may not be entirely total. I think that the Church Greek is easier for Greeks than the Church Slavonic is for the Russians. Um, apart from anything else, Church Slavonic has a somewhat different alphabet. Now, that was only part of your question. Mm -hmm. Uh, remind me of the other part, sure which I was rather know. elusive. Um, sorry, it, it was, in a sense, it was um, a, a question about any Western contribution to re-evangelizing, if you like, the, the uh, churches in the uh, former Soviet Union and the, uh, the uh, communist bloc. Um, what kind of help uh, can we really offer? Or do, do we just, as we should do in politics, keep out of it? Yes. Let me answer that by first looking back to the story of the Orthodox emigration in the 20th century, and particularly the Russian emigration. Now, the effect of being uprooted from their home country, losing everything, coming into exile, often brought people back to a living faith in the church that many people who had not been practicing orthodox in Russia recovered their faith in the emigration. And often it was contact with Western Christians that brought them to rethink their own orthodox faith and to understand it much better. 
in the light of the questions that Western Christians were posing. And I think that many of the leading Orthodox theologians who have worked in the West would say that while they remained firmly Orthodox and didn't wish to borrow wholesale from Western Christian non-Orthodox sources, yet it was meeting non-Orthodox that helped them to understand who they were. And it's interesting, the Russian theologian Vladimir Lossky, after the Second World War, he had been living since the 1920s in the West, after the Second World War, they reopened the theological schools, or a limited number of them, in Russia. And he was invited back to go and teach there. And he declined to do so. He said, I have been shaped by my experience of living in the West. And therefore, what I have to say about orthodoxy needs to be said to a Western audience. And therefore, I would not be a suitable person to go back to Russia and teach there. So there, he certainly felt that the experience of being in the West, studying in a Western university, meeting Western Christians, uh, that this had brought him to a new understanding of orthodoxy. So I think this has been the experience of very many orthodox during the past century. I'm not sure, just to pursue this line of thought, in Russia today, who are the leading theologians? In the Russian emigration, from the 1920s onwards, there were outstanding theologians of Russian birth in the West. Father Sergei Bulgakov, Vladimir Lossky, Father George Florovsky, Father John Mayendorf, Father Alexander Schmemann. Who are their successors? And who are the outstanding creative theologians in Russia today? Now, it may just be my ignorance, but I'm not aware of group similar to those in the period from the 20s to the 60s who were active in the West. So I just put a question mark there. Where are the future Orthodox theologians? And we are quite short of theologians in the um, in, in, in the ecumenical patriarchate. I was talking some weeks ago with Metropolitan John Ziziulas of Pergamon. Now, I should be 80 this year, and he is several years older than me. And we said to each other, yes, we represent an ancient faith and we are ancient persons. We should long since have been put out to grass in retirement. We shouldn't be used as spokesmen for the church. But we said, where are the younger people in the ecumenical patriarchate who are acting as active spokespersons? Um, well, there are some. And in North America, I note that there are a number of laymen who are quite active in theology and are teaching in Western uh, 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 theological schools. Um, so I'm not too pessimistic, but still I think there is a question about the future of Orthodox theology, who are going to be our banner bearers in the coming generation. How do the churches in Greece and in the former Tobias sphere of influence how do they how do the churches in Greece and in the former Soviet sphere of influence respond to Western Protestant missionaries at present? Do they involve the state and how appropriate is the way they are responding? So 
so far as Greece goes, as I say, the Anglicans for more than a century have been supportive towards the Orthodox and have not tried to proselytize, though in this country there are plenty of Orthodox who have become Anglicans. We hear a little about Western people who have become Orthodox in this country, but let us as Orthodox recognize that we are losing far more people than we are gaining. We have no reason to be triumphalist um, on that point. Um, in Greece, though, uh, the intervention of Western missionaries from Protestant sects in America, often with a lot of financial support, this is widely resented and also the intervention, I don't suppose they should be classified as Christians, of the Jehovah's Witnesses, who indeed have sometimes provoked the Greek people by speaking against the Mother of God, which is not a popular move in a Greek Orthodox audience. Um, so uh, there's often been resentment and there is freedom for the missionaries to work in Greece but I think the law gives a certain protection to the Orthodox Church as the dominant religion and therefore open attacks on the Orthodox Church would, I think, open you to legal action in Greece and restrictions by the police. So you have to be careful there. But there is basically religious freedom. Any Greek who wants to become a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses is at liberty to do so. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, among other such groups, can distribute their literature and so on though if it attacks the Orthodox Church, it might be confiscated. Um, in Russia, there are certainly restrictions on proselytism. The Church does enjoy a protected status. Um, again, I think there is in principle freedom of religion. There have, after all, in Russia, there has been a large-ish um, Baptist Evangelical Church, whose roots go back certainly to the 19th century. They too were persecuted under the Communists, and they have fairly friendly relations with the Orthodox, and I think they do not indulge in attacks on the Orthodox, and certainly they have full freedom of worship. They can have their theological schools in Russia and maintain their church life. Um, again, I think restrictions apply rather to the Protestant sects who have no real roots in Russia, who are coming in from the outside, and their interventions are resented, and the state, I think, does protect them. But there is a question in Russia whether sufficient safeguards are in place to protect religious minorities. I think there are some questions there. But as far as I know, the Baptist evangelicals have no complaints. They can live their church life in full freedom. So it's a mixed picture. Is it right that the church should have a privileged, protected status? I would say in Greece and Russia there are strong historical reasons for this and perhaps also in Romania. Um, religious freedom, yes, but freedom for negative propaganda, that perhaps should be restricted. Yes. Can 
I have no easy answer, no magic rabbit to bring out from my Kalamavkion to uh, solve that. But one thing that I attach great value to is exchange of students. Rather than curse the darkness, I'd like to light a candle in my answer. When people are students, first of all, they have a lot of time, which they may not have later in life with a family to bring up. And secondly, they are often uh, quite impressionable, open to new ideas. And so I would favor very much exchange of students among the different Orthodox countries. And certainly the Church of Greece does offer many scholarships to Orthodox from elsewhere. And no doubt that happens in other places too. And many of these people, if they are theological students, are going to become church leaders in future years. And so it would be very good to that they have had experience of life in the other Orthodox <coughs> churches. And you need to get people young, because when they get older and become important and go around in theological jet set from one conference to another and have the red carpet unfolded before them and sit at formal dinners, then they're probably fairly set in their ideas. They need to much earlier be exposed to uh, how their fellow Orthodox think. So I would see a valuable possibility there. There is also though this applies perhaps to an intellectual elite, uh, there is also the role of theological translations. When I first went to Greece in the 1950s, there was virtually nothing translated by Russian writers. Uh, yes, you could get to the works of Berdyaev in Greek because a particular Greek bishop was very interested in Berdyaev, and um, he had translated his writings. And uh, yes, uh, the My Life in Christ by Father John of Kronstadt was very popular, but nothing else. Now you would find that all the leading works by Russian Orthodox writers have been translated into Greek. Lasky, Florovsky, Mayandor, Schmeyman, Evdokimov, Olivier Clement, and so on. Even my writings, too, yes. Uh, so there is a much wider selection of Orthodox writings by non-Greeks that is available. So I think that is a way in which uh, ideas might percolate um, between uh, different parts of the Orthodox Church. Um, and basically, we are all faced by a similar situation, as I hinted, that we are living, whatever country we're in, in an atmosphere that is increasingly secular, perhaps not in Russia, because they had militant atheism. But the situation of Greek Christians is very similar to the situation of Christians in Britain or North America, growing up in an uh, environment that is basically not persecuting, but not at all sympathetic to the Christian worldview. And so I think it's a very similar outlook. Uh, I opposed uh, the translation of my own writings into Greek um, for example, my uh, Penguin book on the Orthodox Church, I said, you don't need a book like that in Greece. It was written for Western people. Uh, you know all about the Orthodox Church. 
uh, you don't need a general introduction of that kind. And they said, oh yes, we do, because our young people do not know all about the Orthodox Church, and uh, they are growing up in an atmosphere very similar to that of young people in the West. And so I said, all right. And they reprinted that in Greek. But I think uh, the situation is very similar, whether in the former communist countries or in Greece, <coughs> to what we are facing in the West. Yes. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, my husband knows the myths, and my husband is from the reason we, we um, are closely associated with Cyprus is because my husband worked as one of the controllers there at the head office, as you say, sir. So you know the politics of why they would use the Orthodox Church is because it's based in an Orthodox country and the influence there is, is important. But um, the World Vision people, the Russian government, um, after the separatist movement of the Chechens, had made it very, very difficult for Western missionaries to function there because many of them were involved in, in sort of, not proselytizing, but helping communities. They, they do, World Vision does that work. They go into, into communities to provide um, a clinic or something like that. And the Russians have stopped the visas. And you have to, you have to meet certain criteria now. So there is a, a less obvious way of, of, of um, dampening down uh, missionary work from others. And uh, finally, back to Cyprus again, when I first went there, um, somebody, somebody came into to where we live and they said, oh, what, you know, are you Christian? And I said, yes. Well, what's your denomination? And I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't have one, don't really want one, before I became Orthodox. Ah, he said, you're Orthodox, and walked off. <laughs> and I thought, and I stood there, and I thought, what does he mean by that? But they, it's like in the Islamic countries that I've uh, also lived in for many years. If you're born, uh, when <coughs> you are born, you are a Muslim. And in, 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 certainly in Cyprus, possibly in Greece, when you are born, you are Orthodox. And that's it. There is no, you know, it's just an accepted way, whereas that's not the case in the West, that wouldn't be the case. So yes, thank you. Yes, that's, that's, I accept that. First, I accept that we Orthodox need to search our consciences about the way we are behaving over religious freedom. But I think the situation in Russia is more serious than, say, in a country like Greece mm, or Cyprus, so, yes. for that matter, mm. where uh, there may be certain protection to the uh, state church as the church of the people, but um, there is also greater freedom. Um, yes, um, and I think your other comments are quite fair. Um, while we're speaking of Cyprus, which I didn't say much about, let me recall a um, interview that I had with Archbishop Makarios in the year 1971. And he, at that time, had the double role of being head of the Orthodox Church, but also uh, president of the country. This was a continuation of the kind of situation that existed in the Ottoman Empire, where the ecumenical patriarch was regarded as responsible not only in religious, but in civil matters for the Christian Orthodox population. He was ethnarch. And um, I talked to Archbishop Makarios about this double role, and he said, I would like to retire as president. I think the time has come when the president should not be the archbishop. He should be a layman. But he said, at this present moment, I'm conscious that there's nobody to take my place. But I expect to be the last ethnarch of this kind, and I look forward to the days when I can simply be archbishop and not head of state. Well, he was never able to do that, but it was interesting that this was the way he saw his role. 
And I also asked him, what do you think is the most important thing you can do for uh, the Orthodox Church in Cyprus? What is your main priority? And he said, it is to raise the standard of the married parish clergy so that they may be better educated and more respected in the community. So I was interested by that priority that he had. Yes, you had a question. Thank you. I, I wondered about the other churches, uh, the, the non uh, Chalcedonian churches that you mentioned, the Church of the East. Is there scope for in, improving and continuing dialogue with, with them, with the Orthodox Church? Is, what, what's going to happen there? And what, what is your view on where that can go? Yes. In the period roughly, say, from 1964 to 1989, there were very promising conversations between the, let us call them, Byzantine Orthodox and the non-Chalcedonians. These labels have their defects. Of course, both sides call themselves Orthodox, so we've got to find labels that will <coughs> distinguish them. Uh, these conversations began at first on an informal level, but then they became official between the two churches, and they were on a pan-Orthodox, pan-Oriental uh, level on both sides. The Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia was uh, very positive in supporting this dialogue. And in 1989, the dialogue said, we believe that we have established a sufficient agreement in doctrine to restore Eucharistic communion. As you will know, the Orthodox Church does not favor intercommunion between separated church bodies. They would say, we cannot have communion in the sacraments till we share the same faith. Sharing the same faith, of course, does not mean sharing the same theological opinions. You can still have unity in diversity there. <coughs> but since 1989, despite that declaration by representatives of both sides, Eucharistic communion has not, in fact, been restored. And there doesn't seem to have been, alas, very much progress in the last 25 years there is a certain inertia, a certain lack of leadership, um, perhaps a lack of a real desire to carry things further forward. And the difficulty also is that on both sides there are conservative groups, rigorists, who are opposed to this dialogue. On the orthodox side particularly, the monks of Mount Athos, of the Holy Mountain, have put out statements saying that uh, the non-Chalcedonian, the Oriental Orthodox, as they're often called, are Monophysite heretics. So they continue to argue that the view of Christ held by the non-Chalcedonians is gravely defective. Yet the dialogue decided that there was a difference in terminology, but that the two sides agreed, essentially, that Christ is fully and completely God and fully and completely human, and yet one person. They used different terminology but had a single faith. So there are conservative groups also, I think, among the Oriental Orthodox who uh, regard us as Nestorians and think that we divide Christ into two because we say that he has two natures. So there have been quite vocal groups on both sides, and I am particularly aware of those on our side, <coughs> the Chalcedonian Orthodox, who are opposing the dialogue. I think it's a great pity we haven't pushed this forward, but there's been a certain lack of in leadership from the top level. But wouldn't it give the Orthodox more well, I think it would, yes. I would be very glad of that. Um, 
and especially in the Near East, where, as I said, we are a minority in a, a predominantly Muslim environment. Um, so I would hope that this could be pushed forward. I find this much the most encouraging of the different ecumenical dialogues that are going on on the Orthodox side. The dialogue with the Roman Catholics is very important. The dialogue with the Anglicans is also valuable, though less likely to produce specific results. Um, but uh, it is with the, the Oriental Orthodox that we ought to be pursuing it. And I wish there was more initiative from above. Maybe the initiative may come from below as it were. Well, one might hope so. Because um, when I spent um, a month doing research, staying in the Syrian Orthodox uh, Theological Seminary, the Indian Orthodox, uh, very clearly a desire, the registrar who organizes these meetings and uh, spoke for the people there and the bishops saying that they would like to see the Institute play a role in this, in bringing the two sides together, the Byzantines and the non-Chalcedonians, for preliminary sort of uh, talks. And we are waiting for some development and hope this, this can be arranged. And, uh, yes, David, that's a task for you to occupy your spare time. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It's yes. simply a matter of all funding and then organization. But the, the will is there, certainly. Yes. and. This is part of the trouble with the official dialogues, which are important, but often they involve just a limited group of theologians and specialists, and very little is known about these dialogues among the Christian people as a whole, and it's a need for them, the dialogues, to be received. For example, um, a few years ago, the Anglican Orthodox Dialogue, Pan-Anglican, Pan-Orthodox International, produced a lengthy report, really a theological treatise, called The Church of the Triune God, over a hundred pages, with very many valuable points in it. And I get invited round quite often to speak to Anglican audiences about the Orthodox Church, and often these audiences have quite a few clergy in them. And I like to ask them, how many of you have read this report? <laughs> and out of an audience of a hundred some little time ago, I think two people raised their hands. And this is the <coughs> trouble that uh, these groups often have very positive discussions, but it doesn't get known among the Christian people as a whole. And I think that applies to the um, Chalcedonian, non-Chalcedonian dialogue that until the Christian people as a whole have a fervent desire for unity perhaps things will not happen perhaps the Christian people as a whole in this room wants to have lunch I don't know <laughs> and there's one question at the back and I think maybe we must pay yes. yes. well, many centuries the language of orthodox theology and biblical has been Greek do you think it can continue to be so? Do you think that it was to be so, taking into account what Dorothy famous claim that Christianity is genetically linked to Greece? I love the Greek language. I started to learn ancient Greek when I was about 11, and I think it would be a wonderful thing if everybody learnt Greek. On the other hand, Christianity has never been limited to any one single language. It was originally Jewish, but at a very early date, Christianity moved out from a Jewish environment into the Greco-Roman world. And most of the Greek fathers didn't, in fact, know Hebrew, though Origen did. And then again, we think of uh, the development of the missions from Byzantium. At a time when the Western Church was insisting in its missionary work on the use of Latin, the 
missionaries who came from Constantinople, Cyril and Methodius in particular, and went out into the Slav lands, from the beginning translated into the vernacular. Well, Church Slavonic is not exactly an ordinary spoken language, but it was a language that was intelligible to the Slav peoples, and their preaching was therefore in the language of the people. The liturgy was translated, the Bible was translated, and Christianity was presented not in the Greek form, but in a form that the Slav people could understand. So I think in that way, while certainly the tradition of the Greek fathers is influential for uh, orthodox thinking, we are not limited to any one language. And it has been our principle to celebrate services, to preach the faith, to teach the faith in the language of the people. And that, I think, is the true orthodox approach. Um, there's been considerable uh, reservations, for example, in the Greek archdiocese in this country to using English. Uh, English is still not used, in my view, nearly as much as it should be in our Greek parishes. But in principle, the faith can be taught and thought in any language. So I'm fully in favor of drawing upon our English intellectual tradition in presenting orthodoxy. It would be an excellent thing if those of, who are seriously interested in the orthodox faith have also some acquaintance with Western philosophy and can understand that uh, a little. Let them read Locke, Berkeley and Hume, uh, for example. Um, uh, uh, these are excellent writers, easily understood. I began reading Berkeley when I was 13 and found it very enjoyable. Um, so uh, we need to present orthodoxy, not just in the language, but in the intellectual categories of the society to which we belong. Um, otherwise, we lose se a, s a sense of the um, universality of orthodoxy, of its Catholicity. Father George Florovsky used to say, uh, spiritually, we are all Greeks, or Hellenes, he would have said. Well, I would agree with that. I even quoted that in the address <coughs> I gave at my ordination as a bishop. Um, but I would underline the word spiritually, not necessarily linguistically. Uh, thank you. Well, you've had a prime example of the benefits of the English intellectual tradition to orthodoxy. <laughs> um, and uh, I, at the moment, I'll ask you to applaud, but to say that we really must feed and water the bishop if, he, if he's able to <laughs> carry on <laughs> next time. We look forward to a new session, and we thank you very much, and lunch will be that way. Thank you.